All right. Thank you. All right. So again, case study one was cheating strike Bobby out is due next week. Everybody has to upload their PowerPoint. Everybody uh, has to upload their reflection. One of you will be responsible. Usually it's the, the Zoom leader. Uh, group one will go, go first. Uh, and then we'll reverse the order the next week. So by the end, everybody will get a chance to go first. Um, and so um, you will work through your case. You will, will tell us, please remember, uh, again, please remember the law. Principal assigns grades. The teacher has, has recommended or has tried to assign this grade. Uh, look at from the legal aspect and, and, the, and the ethical aspect. Please remember. Don't get hung up on, well, it, the, the policy said that they may receive a failing grade. That's for the assignment. That's not for the year. We're going to look at, at the, we're going to look at that in the CMS handbook in just a minute. Um, obviously, uh, excluding a kid for an entire year is a little bit rough for a cheating offense. Uh, and it's a zero tolerance expulsion. You need to research zero tolerance expulsion, uh, which means that's a federal that's a federal crime that's 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 illegal to do that so you you need to make sure you dig down don't just say well you know we always side with the teacher because that's what we do as administrators i want to be the teacher's champion i had lunch with one of my former ap's today who is now a principal and who does some work for bird new web and i met her for lunch today and uh, she teaches for us here at garden new web and she was a principal fellow um a long time ago she was you know so this is not some fly by night person and she said you know i'm so embarrassed now that when i went to my principal fellow interview i told them that my goal was to be the champion for the teacher she said boy how stupid was i and and that's correct you need to be champion for kids you need to keep that in mind what your job is not only your, your legal job but your ethical job and you know i've already let the cow out of the bag so you know, I'm, I'm old. I can't stand for y'all to raise my blood pressure. So I, I'm expecting these to be great next week and not some of these that I've had in the past where they come in and say, well, we can tell a teacher if she was wrong behind closed doors, but, you know, in public, we're going to support her. Uh, again, that's when your mama told you when you were just little, if your friend jumped off the roof, would you jump off with them? You don't need to jump off. Um, you, you need to understand what you're doing here. So that's going to be next week. <clears throat> Is your case study. Does anybody have any questions on what the expectation is for the first case study? Hearing none, we'll move on to the skip then. So let me share my screen. We're, we're getting to the point where most of you are completing your OMA. If you're not, you should be fairly soon because it's already February. Um, it's actually the end of the first week of February. We're in the second week of February. So you ought to be knocking this, this OMA out pretty soon and moving on to your skip so that we can get to the, uh, the cap before the end of the semester. Now, I had a question came in earlier this week. One of them said, I looked everywhere. I could not find the template for the skip. That's because there isn't one. <clears throat> Remember gradual release or some of you, you know, refer to it as attentional abandonment. But no, it's gradual release. Your, your app cell was complete, had all the notes in it, do this, don't do that. Your app tail had a lot of stuff. It was a little bit less. Then you got your OMA this semester. It was just a template. It just had the directions. There is none of that for the skip. You won't get one for the cap either. You have to make your own. You have to go through and add all your tasks and prompts and the directions. Now, don't just start writing. We want the task and the prompts. Make your own. It, you know. If I can do it, certainly you can. It won't take you but 15 or 20 minutes. Make you a template that looks like the OMA template has the same things in it. It's just a copy and paste and then start and then start filling it out. But you need to learn to do that as well. But don't don't just folks just start a narrative and then when it goes to the graders, they don't have the task and prompts right there. They like that. That's a courtesy. Um, what is it we call that? In reading, when you're teaching little kids to read, it's called anticipatory set. Um, and so, um, you know, the old Dick and Jane books, the, the, the mother, the big books in whole language, the rhyming where we get kids to anticipate the next word. Well, your, your graders want to anticipate what's coming next already as well. 
So do not forget to put your task and prompts in your template. Uh, that's very important. If you were old enough, I would remind you from the, the gag from the movie No Time for Sergeants from back in the 50s with uh, Andy Griffith and Don Knotts um, was pretty funny. It had, it had an, anticipatory, an anticipatory set joke in it, which is pretty advanced for that time in, in our history. But um, that's the notion for those of you who teach young emerging readers, you understand. We want to prompt them. We want them to know what's coming. All right, so uh, understand that there is no, no template for the skip. So let's talk about the skip. The skip is a school community improvement plan. What we're gonna do is we're gonna build a plan, a marketing plan for our school. And the whole notion is, first of all, we gotta go out and, and grab these parents. We've gotta connect with them using social media, what, whatever it takes to get them. And then, but that's not, that's not the goal. The goal is to get them to come to school and be involved with their child's education, to get them to come to school to educational events like family math night, family reading night, um, job fairs, college fairs, EOG night, EOC night. We're trying to get them to come to our campus for academic purposes. Think of it this way. Let us help you help your child. Maybe we're doing family math night. We give you manipulative. We teach you to do these things for smaller kids. But we're trying to get parents involved in the education of their children. But if we just send notices out, you know, uh, my wife even does it to me, pins a note to my shirt when I go to work each morning, remind me what I got to do. Um, you know, we used to do that when I was an elementary principal. We pin notes back and forth home on the, on the shirts of little kids. Well, that doesn't work real well. I'll put it in middle schoolers' book bags. We've got to find a way initially to connect with these parents for the purpose of then in getting them in and involving in their child's education. So the, the point of the exercise is not just to communicate with them. I know we think that, you know, that everybody now, just like my doctoral group last Saturday, I got in a rant. At least as I was at home, I could throw stuff at my own house. Um, that, that, you know, that communication is not the be all end all. It's a, it's a vehicle to get us where we want to be. Um, and so what we want is to connect and bring them in. So our short term goals when we do our needs assessment for gaps in communication, our short term is things that will help us communicate better. Now, that's a short term goal. So let's go to our to our task and prompts. this out of the way. The candidate will lead the SKIP team to conduct the needs assessment to determine the gaps in communication between the internal and external. Now, the internal and external communities is school and home, for those of you who don't know what that means. Now, do not get fancy. Again, uh, don't think you're hurting the team. It says gaps in communication. It does not say we're going to do a needs assessment to see what, what materials we need or, or what athletic supplies or what or, or what where our gaps are in our instructional program. Remember, we did instruction last semester. We're doing operations this semester. If it says we want to do a needs assessment to determine gaps in communication, when that opening paragraph that tells us what you're going to be doing, purpose of this. It should say, we're going to do a needs assessment to determine gap communication. Don't get fancy. Don't think. That's exactly what we're doing. We're not doing an instructional audit here. We did that last semester. That's, that, that, that's where most students go wrong on this. They don't read the prompt and say, they say, well, that, that's just, that, that don't sound like very much. That's a lot. We're doing communication now. We're doing operations here. And gaps in communication, how... How are we communicating? How are we not communicating? What we do is we go to our advanced ed or Cognia survey in South Carolina, our, our uh, 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 teacher work condition survey in North Carolina, and we look at our parent survey results. And a lot of districts, I know Greensboro, a lot of the they bigger districts, that big for they, they, they do a lot of parent surveys. Charlotte Mecklenburg does one. You get the results of your parent survey, and if you don't want, you do do a parent survey separately every spring. I know that you do teacher working condition survey in advance then, and it has a section in there on parent communication. And we look at that. That's where we determine what our gaps are. 
we look at that we look at that 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 data and it tells us and we can talk to people as well what are the gaps how can we fix those gaps so we need a clear we need a clear background description of setting that's from apps that's from app cell task one you also had that in your oma task one uh, where you you tell about your school so that's just a copy and paste a clear statement of purpose and needs set we're trying to find gaps in communication list participants that's who your team is analysis of your finding a set of recommendations that identifies avenues communications that will be established we're going to start a facebook page we're going to start doing twitter instagram messages those things and then finally we're going to have a set of long and short term objectives or goals now let me again stop my share please understand that a long-term goal is not just a short-term goal over a longer period of time oh my <clears throat> i get so exercised on this one a short-term goal our short-term goal is how we're going to communicate twitter instagram uh facebook our long-term goal is an event family math night family reading night family eog night i see half the time when it comes in it says here's my short-term goals and the short-term goals is just keep doing the short-term goals next semester no that's just still short-term goals that's still just short-term goals we're doing the communication in the short term in order to be able to get to the long term it's no good to have an, a, a family math night nobody shows up for now let's be clear here just getting parents to come to your school will not raise your test score if that were the case, you know, in the eastern part of the state, we would have a donkey basketball game. In the Piedmont, we'd have a barbecue. And in the western part of the state, we'd have a womanless wedding. If we did those, we could kill it. We'd have a million people on our campus, but it won't make your test scores go up. Now, I was in Charlotte Mecklenburg in the central office during the 10 years that Independence won, what, nine or 10 state AA football, four AA football titles in a row. Uh, Tommy Knox had it rolling down at Independence down in Mint Hill, which is on the east side of Charlotte. I swear to you, you could go down there because I was there a lot of times in my role in the central office. And there'd be 20,000 people at a high school football game. You can't believe how many people that were there. I, you, the, the, there wasn't a parking space anywhere in Mint Hill. I mean, they had we had run shuttles to get people to the game. It was the most incredible thing you've ever seen in your life. But their test scores, I mean, <clears throat> Most of that crowd couldn't spell cat and spotted them to C and the A. Uh, it did not make test scores go up. Simply getting them on your campus for some athletic event or step team or something like that will, or talent show will not make your scores go up. But if you can engage them in their child education, let us help you help your child, especially the younger ones. If we can turn them out to family math night, family reading night, you know, those kinds of things, we can have an impact in our school if we can link, if we can, if we can grab those parents and get them involved in their child's education. How many times have you heard teachers say, I, it, 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 this may be one of the dumber things that I've ever heard. Every time we'd have parent night in school when I was principal, all these teachers would say, well, the parents I needed to see didn't come. Well, duh. <clears throat> That's why, that's why you need to see them because they're not engaged in their child's education. That's why they act like idiots all day, every day in your room uh, <clears throat> because their parents aren't engaged. That's a duh. What have you done to try to reach out and get those parents in here? I'm, I'm down here in the home ec department cooking spaghetti to try to get them to come. What are you doing? Nothing. Well, then don't whine and complain and get your apron on and help me cook this spaghetti. Um, if you can't do anything else, of course, the ones that don't come are the ones we need to see. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get them to come. Uh, that's the whole notion of the skip. Now, the second part, the second prompt in task one, share my screen again. The second part of that prompt is we're gonna, we're gonna simply look at, again, our teacher working condition survey or our advanced ed survey. And we're going to look at the school leadership uh, section not not teacher leadership no bueno we did that last semester in the app tell we're looking at the school leadership section 
and see if we can again if we can come up for some improve some some recommendations for school leadership um uh, uh, that would help them in this area as well uh, so we're going to try to number one we're going to look and see we're doing gaps in communication some short-term things to better communicate with parents some long-term things and some events we can get them in to help them help their child. And then we're going to take a critical look at the school administration to see if there's something that they could do better to help out with this problem of parent disengagement. That's what we're trying to do. So that is task one of the skip. Now it gets, gets pretty simple after that. In, in task two, we're going to identify the funding necessary to accomplish both the short-term goals and any of the other, or the principal, if there's anything that would cost for, for the recommendations to, in, to improve your school leadership um, and also the resource identification. So that's money and people that it would take to pull this off. Now, to that end, I have put you a graphic organizer. Let's go back to skip task and prompt. You notice it says right here, it says partial graphic organizer be used with skip task two. And so what that is, is this, this is our standard graphic organizer. We need this part, the one down here at the bottom, we need this to go with task two of the skip. What activity, you know, short term, what we're gonna do, who's gonna be responsible, the resources needed, fiscal, that means money and human, which means people. We fill this out. Now we're gonna use this one as we always do in task four or, or task three when we do our marketing plan. So that's what task three is, is the marketing plan. So when we go to our task and prompts, task three is state, statement of the purpose of the plan, just like you did with your app sale, with your action plan, with your app tell, with your growth plan. Uh, our plan this semester is a marketing plan. And so it's the same thing, strengths of the current program, opportunities for impact for the community. And then you will summarize all this in the full graphic organizer. And then you will write your competencies as you normally do. So once you get through with one, with task one, you, you know, it, it's literally minutes after that and you're done. Uh, because you identify your resources in three, you put it all together in, in task two, you put it all together in your plan in task three, and then you write your competencies in four. But the trick is don't get sidetracked, don't get, don't, you know, don't, don't think too much, do is exactly what it says. This is just a needs assessment to determine gaps in communication. And from there, we know where we go to find that information on our district's parent survey and or the teacher working condition survey or the advanced ed survey, the parent and communication section. Look at both of them. Come up with some ideas of what you could do at your school, family math night, family reading night. Now, um, not too far from Dr. Holloman, uh, geographically would be uh, maybe a couple hours, uh, but across the state, directly to the west from him, uh, is Northwest Guilford High School, um, maybe maybe two hours away, um, something in that neighborhood. Greensboro is about an hour, so about maybe two hours away. Northwest Guilford, <clears throat> I had uh, I had a number of interns there. <clears throat> and we did a number of projects over the years. And I, I think I had, I think maybe nine students over the course of like four or five years there. And we just, it, we really had it rolling there, but um, their skip, what they did, they did a, a uh, college, they did kind of like a job fair. And you said, wait a minute, this is a high school. What in the world are you doing a job fair? How, how's that gonna help you? But what they did, they partnered with Novant. And they had all these tables around of all these, of these associated businesses and, and jobs and those kinds of things. But what they did on every table, um, and they invited parents and, and students in, but they didn't just invite seniors in, they invited freshmen. This was for freshmen that had just gotten to high school. And I was like, I wish I'd been smart enough to figure this out. 
and they invited these freshmen in to this job fair. No vault. We had a big lunch and it was wonderful. Had all it was in the gym. Had all these tables set up, <laughs> and on every table it had you know, This is the job. This is how much money you can make if you get this job. But it also, more importantly, had a take on the table. These, this is the, the college degree that you will, or degrees that you will need to get this job. And these are the advanced courses in high school that you will need to take. Again, on that list, these are the advanced courses in high school that you will need to take in order to go to college, major in this, to get this job and make this much money. We got all these parents to come in, no bond, sponsored food, and did all these things about all us in. Northwest Guilford had the highest number of kids taking advanced placement courses of any school in the state of North Carolina in two years from that. Two, two years. Completely changed the culture of that school in two years. You know, Ralph was principal then, Ralph Kitley. I don't know if you know any of you know Ralph, but uh, um now, I like Ralph, uh, even though what Ralph went to Duke, didn't he? Didn't he play center for Duke's basketball team? Um, you know, I won't hold that against Ralph. But now, even though Ralph went to Duke, Ralph would be the first to tell you that, you know, he's not the smartest fella <clears throat> in the conversation. And, 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 but Ralph was smart enough to understand what this could do. And he got out of the way. And, and it, it, you know, again, I had a number of interns there. And, um, uh, we involved several different departments, CTE. We had a business teacher who, who did the partnership with Novant. But the next thing you know, we completely turned the culture of that school around, or they did, I didn't, I was just supposed to be there to eat. Uh, but completely turned the culture of that school around with, with their skip. Now, you, won't, you may not hit upon that great idea. That's the best one I've ever seen. It was just like unbelievable how it transformed that school in terms of all those students taking those higher level classes. And they, they continue to do that on and on. Um, and then I had one at, uh, in Winston, um, trying to remember which high school, I, I know the name is not well as I know my own. Uh, Parkland, at Parkland in Winston-Salem. Um, we had an event for all of these ESL kids and we had two people show up, two, dose, two. Uh, and then somebody, it wasn't me, had the idea, well, maybe we could find out who the, the go-to person in the community was. And it was brother, it was Father Jose over at the church. And we got plugged into him and were able to get some passes for the city bus. And the next thing you know, we had 400 people. At, at, at a, a, an event. And again, it changed the trajectory of that entire school by getting all those, those non-English speaking parents in and beginning to get some community services some assistance and getting them signed up and getting the kids in the right courses. And it just made all the difference in the world in part. Again, their principal at that time, Bill, you know, again, uh, smart enough to get out of the way. Um, and, and, and the point of talking about Bill and Ralph is, is that, that you, you, sometimes you don't have to have the greatest ideas yourself, but you have to recognize what other people do. Um, and so utilize your team. Uh, this is one of those that would be easy kind of just to go this year alone. But, but, but when you start looking for these long-term events, you might want to involve some more people on your staff that have some great ideas about we could really now that we that we can communicate with them. This is something we really need in our school that we that this would be a great idea for us to do. I mean, you know, I don't know whether it was um, Birdie or uh, I mean, Ke Keisha Sinclair. I don't you know, that was been 10 years ago. I don't remember which one it was and I'm not sure they remember which one it was. But, but together, the synergy of their group, they came up with those ideas. I mean, I remember the group, Dr. Wendy and, and the others that, that I had at Parkland, Jonathan, and, and all of those, and uh, Lisa. Um, I remember them to this day. I don't remember which one of them found out about Father Jose at the Catholic Church. Don't, it was not important. But the, the important part was, is there was a synergy that happened. The group got together, they had ideas. Don't, don't just phone it in on this. You have the potential to really make an impact at your school. 
with the skill. This one, you really have the potential. So I implore you not to phone it in. Uh, when you're looking for your long-term events, you know, family math night, job fair, whatever it is, try to find something that, that actually that you could pull off at your school. Now, you won't be penalized if you don't actually, your school doesn't do it, but try to find something that, that you think that could be pulled off at your school. I'm gonna pause now. I'm going to pause now. Believe it or not, we're on time. And I'm going to go to our two resident principal experts. And I'm going to let them talk to you about these kind of events, things that they've done, and what impact potentially they could have on schools. I'll start with, uh, with, with Dr. Griffin Jordan tonight. Dr. Griffin Jordan, welcome. Thank you. Okay. So, um, of course, as Dr. Lamb indicated, um, parent involvement is crucial to the success of, of your school and to help the students reach their potential. Um, I've been in different schools. I've been in the elementary, middle, and high school. I've seen many different types of um, events take place. Some have bombed and some have been the most successful ever. Um, the ones that I've, I've seen that bombed, you have a very, um, enthusiastic, energetic uh, teacher or a couple of teachers that have a great idea and they try to push it themselves and they push it out. Everything is just brilliantly set up, but then they don't do the networking they need to get the parents in. Beautiful, I mean, you have people from everywhere coming in, you have food from the finest restaurants and then nobody's there because that connection was not reached. How do we reach the parents? What you said, Dr. Lamb, is, is perfect. Um, I was at one of my middle schools that I worked at um, several years ago. It was the transportation component. We ended up having our activity buses, and it was a neighborhood school. We had our activity buses go around to pick up, um, and we made it a fun event, you know, fun, you know, kind of, you know, we're, we're I can't remember what we called it. It was a cartoon type bus. I can't remember, but we had the buses going around to pick up the families and bring them back. And they came. And of course, the spaghetti dinners, the hot dogs and hamburgers, you've got to feed them because you're asking them to come out at six o'clock. That's dinner time. So you, that is hands down. There's got to be food for the entire family. Um, also, one thing that makes it work is when you get out into your community, you let the parents know that they are valued. Um, what we're planning to do next year to boost up our parent involvement, we're gonna have uh, listed on their, their sheet when they get into, their, uh, into class for the first day They'll have their parents' occupation and, and different things about what their parents do. Then we're going to contact their parents and say, you know, it's cold call. It's like calling and you have to find a team. You have to find time to get on the phone and call. Um, we, we're a health science school. We see that you are a nurse at Duke. Would you mind coming? And that's all you have to do. Sure, I'll come. Another thing that we've done with science fairs to get the parents in is um, assign the parent to introduce their student. So now you're not only bringing the parents there, you're giving them an actual role in the event. So the parents are going to come and they're going to be just as sharp as the child is because they're, they're, and they feel important too. And, you know, they're important and their child's important and they're going to push their child to get that science project right. And they're going to rehearse it before they come because now, you know, it's, it's a branch off of, from them, that whole um, event that's going on. So different things, um, and you just have to try it, but you can't, even if you have the greatest idea, if you don't have the school supporting you, you don't have the connection with that community and, and being able to get the parents involved, it's gonna be a great event and no one's gonna be there. Thank you, Dr. Griffin, Jordan. That's, that's why you've gotta do your gaps in communication first. Don't, don't think about what we're going to do until we figure out a way to get in touch with them. You know, what are we going to do? Stand around and look at one another. If nobody comes, it, it can be the greatest event in the world, but if nobody comes, it's not successful. Uh, so please remember that. Uh, Dr. Holloman. 
I, I think there are you know, a couple of things now, especially as we're starting to gear back up with a lot of these events. Um, you know, parents have not been out at schools for the last several years. Most important so, time I've ever seen in my career to do this, to re-engage parents. Yep. Thank and, you. And, and there's a there's a there's a difficulty there too with re-engagement. Um everyone now is uh, very uh, I mean, we're having virtual IEP meetings. We're doing a lot of things that we did not do before that. We used to have parents that would come into all the 504 IEP meetings. Now it's convenient, very convenient to have a lot of those things virtually um, for the, you know, the LEAs, IEP coordinators, and for the parents also. So we're having to try to make sure they understand there's a value of actually coming and being on campus and being back in a face-to-face -face environment. So what can you do to create an environment where they can't get that any other way but being on your campus? So if you're a Title I school and you've got to have a Title I night, it's, it's not just a checkbox so you get your Title I funds completed and you share information. It's a night where you really want to make sure that you're making it something where engagement's happening. Um, what do they get from that moment that they won't get from a regular uh, phone call, email, text message, Facebook, Instagram? Um, you know, information is flowing so freely now that uh, truly, I mean, I, I think we almost are an overload. Um, you know, we're encouraged to send things out in three different methods with every communication. Yeah. So it's a voice, you know, call, it's an email, it's a text message. Um, we've got Facebook and Instagram sending the same thing. And I understand that people say, well, you're supposed to send it out and hear it seven times before you actually reach everyone. Um, but if they hear all these messages every week and they just basically tune you out, then when the important message goes out, they're not listening. So be really careful about how you send things out and that, that when they hear your message go out for the special event, that it's a special message. Um, I don't do voice calls unless it is something really special for our school. Uh, we also have taglines of certain emails that have, you know, a certain kind of, um, of, of letterhead to go out to make sure they understand why it's there. So when you're trying to get these events going, you know, build your team, um, build it early. Don't begin planning for an event uh, that you're going to do on March 1st on February 14th. <laughs> um, you know, uh, get it get it done months in advance. We have a, um, a financial fair that we're doing, um, which is uh, something we did pre-pandemic um, and pre-COVID that, you know, we've already said we want to do it again. Let's go ahead and get on the books. That was with the credit union um, back in October, November, before we were even given approval to have gatherings. But I've already had the date on our calendar since then. So we knew we had the date established to build our team, to build our resources. Same thing with job fair. Uh, we do a spring showcase uh, during registration for our freshmen, kind of like a freshman open house. You know, we've calendared all of those things out, you know, six months plus. The planning teams have already met. You know, we may be told that, you know, oh, we can't do it that way because of some restriction that would happen. But, you know, if we don't, if we wait too long, you're behind the eight ball, your communication doesn't go out, you can't send reminders, and you can't get people engaged. And I think Dr. Griffin Jordan mentioned it too, you know, get your kids engaged, give them roles to play, get your teachers engaged, give them roles to play. Uh, the show's not about you, it's about getting um, all of your stakeholders involved and then building that capacity in your school by finding out if there are other people in the community who want to also be involved. Bring in businesses, bring in other you know, areas, it depends on what your message is, but you, you've got to plan ahead. You got to think ahead. And I mean, I'm, I'm stealing, by the way, the job fair idea um, you know, <laughs> for our job fair. Um, we already have it planned, but I love the idea of bringing the freshmen in and showing them here are the classes you'll need if you want to take these jobs. We've done it usually for our juniors and seniors. Typically, our freshmen don't come into that because they're not, that, that's not quite the job ready group that our business partners are looking for. But what a great way to build, you know, the excitement for the next group. So uh, beg, borrow, and steal also along the way. Yeah. Now, those of you who are not high school people understand when you get freshmen in, um, they're in some, some upper level classes, but they take their advanced level as sophomores, and then they can start taking AP as juniors and seniors. Uh, but, but if you don't start them as freshmen, they won't get in those advanced courses as sophomores. And then they won't be ready for their AJPs and they'll be afraid to take them as juniors and seniors. Now, again, I wish I'd have been smart enough to thought about that, but it doesn't matter who, who was smart enough. That's a brilliant idea. I'm just going to tell you, that's a brilliant idea. 
Uh, and you, know, you make this much money. You make $90,000 a year as an x-ray technician. Oh, well, where well, do I go to get that degree? You go here, you go to East Carolina, they got this program here. Wow. <laughs> but you got to have these courses to get in and get in that, in that program. And, and, and to talk about how times have changed, our um, our freshmen now on their track take two AP courses. Sophomores take can yep. take four. Yep. You know, it's it's pushed down, and so they're they're geared up and ready. They're geared, even they're at the middle school up. area. Yeah, yeah. You can push down now and, and do that. You know, you you can start them earlier if they're ready. Those kids you don't have problems with. It's, it's that bumping up those kids that wouldn't normally take those as freshmen and sophomores, but you can get them prepped as too. You know, everybody understands a normal distribution. And unless you're in a really special situation, you have a certain population of kids that Dr. Holman is talking about that, that, that are ready to take those APs early on. But you have these other kids that if you work and push, you can build them into being the kids that can do that as juniors and seniors. You just didn't do it at all until then. But, but now you have a lot of kids that if you prep them, you can get them there by the time they're juniors or even maybe by the time they're seniors. Kids that wouldn't normally be taking APs. You know, pushing those kids a little bit further. But it's that, you know, it's that carrot of here's this job, need this degree, you need these courses. You know, the, the ones that can take AP classes in the ninth grade, they already know that. They, they, they don't need your help. Well, they they do, but they, they they don't know that. But the other ones, that's that's the ones. You can't just say, well, 25% of my population is eligible to take AP courses. That, that's just the way it goes. Why not 50? Why not grow your own? You know, Northwest Guilford is it's not a a, a up upscale um, school. I mean, it's a good, nice suburban school. Um, but you know, they'd always had about the same percentage every year taking them, but all of a sudden it was, why don't we grow our own? Why don't we start a process where we grow our own of students who wouldn't have normally taken these courses? It's a wonderful thing. It's, it's, a, it's a really good idea. So that is the skip. <clears throat> Those of you who are there, make you a template, jump right in and get started. But again, involve people, communicate, network, do those things, but again, the best and planned and and prepared events in the world, uh, if nobody shows up, aren't of any value. So make sure you understand the communication component. Find those gaps to start with, where you can hook these people. And I thought Dr. Holman made a good point. If you send something out every day, if people kind of get numb. Make sure that they understand when the big stuff's coming. What this is important. So we do that. All right, so. Discipline tonight, North Carolina Department of Public Instruction is the administrative arm of the State Board of Education and the General Assembly. They are charged with the interpretation and enforcement of all the policies and laws, the laws from the General Assembly, the policies of the State Board of Education. And they had to put all that stuff together. And they're the people who are supposed to do the enforcement piece. And so they have come up with a manual um, been around for several years, and here is a copy of it. Let me move some of this stuff out of my way as I go back to my screen share, and that's not the right one. Here it is. Uh, <clears throat> North Carolina Disciplinary Data Reporting Procedures. Now, this is, this is the guide for your state discipline reporting. Now, I don't care who you are, your first administrative job as an AP, you're gonna to have to upload disciplinary data into PowerSchool. This is the this is the Bible or the manual on how you how and what and where and when and why you do it. And it has all the laws and policies in it that tell you those things. Now, this is another one of those where we don't do this at our school, okay? Until you get caught and you lose your house. Uh, again, you will. Th this is the law. This is not suggestions or a good practice or we think you ought to. This book is about law and policy, and it's been put together. Um, and so, the value, the collection of disciplinary data allows the Department of Public Instruction to fulfill its data reporting obligations in the areas of school crime and violence suspensions, expulsions, 
data placements and alternative learning. And the part I told you was right here at the first part. DPI is responsible, state board in for, for those. And so you're gonna see a lot of laws in here. Um, you use power, you use power stool to do it. Um, but here's the first big major piece that you've got to understand. We report incidents, not outcome. What does that mean? Well, if two kids got in a fight, we report two kids got in a fight. Uh, and we don't say, well, we didn't suspend those kids, so we don't have to, suspension is an outcome. That doesn't have anything to do with, with whether two kids fought or not. I mean, I've had principals try to argue with me when I was in central office. If I don't suspend them, I don't have to tell anybody. I said, under that same notion here, is if I whip you all over this building and I leave town before they catch me, then you didn't get whipped. Well, well no. Or if I shot you and left town, you ain't dead. Well, no. Well, that whether you suspend a kid or not has nothing to do with whether he was in a fist fight or, or committed a crime or a, a, a disciplinary infraction. But we have folks who rationalize their cheating, and that's exactly what it is, is cheating. They rationalize that by saying, if I don't punish them or if I didn't suspend them or I didn't give them a serious punishment or it wasn't a serious infraction, I don't have to report it. All of those are in error. And you not only will be in the unemployment line, you will be homeless in the unemployment line if you get caught doing it. I'll just tell you right now. You report everything that goes on on your campus. Well, even you say, well, but it wasn't a student. It was a parent who doesn't matter. It happened on your campus. you got to tell. I had a principal, and I love him, Ron. He was principal at East Mech. He tried to argue, you know, that he had a, this is a, one of the sadder stories that I know. He had a student at 215 when the bell rang, went out and got in his car in the, in the student parking lot and killed himself. And Ron didn't want to report it because he said the bell had already rung. I can't make that up. Um, it happened on your campus. You have to report it. Um, and then it goes, it says, see, I told you 115C requ G requires, <clears throat> again, General Assembly, <clears throat> The state law says what has to be reported. And here's all the acts of crime and violence that have to be reported. And then all these other statutes that speak to that. And also we now do civil rights reporting out of this Office of Civil Rights. So you've got to put everything in there. And so you say, well, Dale, what is everything? You got, if you do a zero tolerance expulsion, you got to tell it. You say, well, that must be okay. No, you got to tell on yourself. You also have to, if you did reclaim, uh, illegally did restrain or seclusion, like when they uh, duct tape the kid to the radiator, you got to tell on yourself. Um, you have to tell all these things, what must be reported. And so you see this big long list of things here. And so I'll just summarize it for you. Everything that's in your code of conduct, everything that the state recognizes as a disciplinary infraction has got to go in power school, period. And don't tell me, well, we use SWIS or PBIS, and so we don't do the bit make everything that happens in your building is legally required to go into power school. I don't care if you use PBIS, I don't care if you use Swiss or, or whatever system of data, everything that happens, as you can see on this list here, has to go into power school. Now, certain things have, have are punitive on you as a school. You've got to understand that. So here are the things that if you have too many of these, you'll lose your job. And so that is one of the reasons why people don't want to report them. So if you exceed the threshold of one for every 200 students or five of these incidents for every thousand students, if you exceed that, which is that's 0.5 or, or half of 1%, if you exceed that, you go on the state watch list and you get audited and you have an on-campus audit and all those things. And if you do it two years in a row, you'll lose your job because it goes back to 1991, 92, no child left behind. It says kids don't have to go to low performing academic schools, nor do they have to go to persistently dangerous schools. These are the incidents that occur on campuses that count against your persistently dangerous statute, homicide, Assault resulting in serious bodily injury, assault involving use of a weapon, rape, sexual offense, sexual fault, assault, kidnapping, robbery with a dangerous weapon, and taking indecent liberties with a Now, 
All of these are clearly defined along, these are acts of violence. The acts of crime that go with them, all of them at the end of this are clearly defined. Here are the description of the behaviors that must be reported. UB is unacceptable behavior. PD is persistently dangerous. That means it's gonna count against you. Um, RO is a violation of the law and you gotta call you the resource officer or the police if it happens, like possession of alcohol, or those things. Now, there's a couple of, there's four anomalies. Uh, actually, there's two anomalies that uh, communicating threats is a violation of the general statute. So you gotta call the police. So even though it says UB, you still have to call the police along with disorderly conduct. There is another one which is burning of a school building, you still have to call, you still have to call the police if that happens. Recording categories, here are the bad behaviors, consequent action type. I mean, it says here, even if you just conference the student, if there is a referral for behavior, it must go in here. If you notice this doesn't just say consequence type in out of school suspension, that it's that it only counts. No, any it doesn't matter. The state doesn't care what you give them in terms of their punishment. That, that's not the whole point of reporting. I mean, whatever you want to give them is fine, but you got to tell us what happened because we have to report to the Office of Civil Rights and they want everything, everything that happened. Victim types, all these people can be victims. Weapon types, um, all of these things can happen. Again, crime definitions, as I told you, they have here are all of your acts of crime and violence. Um, they're all right here. They tell you exactly. I mean, it's even embarrassing if you're a Baptist like me to read all these sexual ones. But here are your 16 acts of crime and violence. Nine of them count against you and your violence. And I've already gone over those with you. Now, you cannot not report this stuff. Now, your district, once you get your job, and hopefully you'll, you'll, your internship supervisor will let you see this. I can show you this one now because it was the iteration of NCYS before power school, but there's an actual manual that they will use with you. This is the one I had made. There's my name on it. I'm the one who had it made. Um, uh, when I was deputy, I had this one made. Uh, that tells you everything that you've got to do. It works you through the screens, everything that you've got to do. You've got to go through this training. Yes, it is this involved. Now, I know you have seen power school. I get it. But you've only seen the teacher portion. The, 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 the discipline module is very, very in-depth. It involves a series of screens. There are rules of what you have to do and what you have to report. Um, you must do that. You must enter that data in. Now, one of the, one of the people at your school, and it says so in the handbook, one of your APs is going to be in charge of making sure it gets done. Usually they'll make you do that as the new person, but it, but but it also says, regardless of who enters it in, with, yeah, we got a data manager, that's on her. No, ultimately the principal is responsible. It says so right there in the statute. You are responsible for data input to make sure it happens. And if you are the disciplinary data coordinator for your, for your school, usually that's an AP that gets that role. You got to make sure all this stuff gets in there. Now, 48 hours for non for, for non acts of crime and violence. 24 hours, state says, acts of crime and violence got to be in, in in here within 24 hours. You can't say, well, I'll, I'll catch that next month, uh, or do that, or do like I had a principal at at, a, at one of the small high schools put it in put the kid up for ex exclusion, and then realized it was going to put them over the limit. Try to pull it out but still kept the kid up for exclusion. Um, <clears throat> um, that, that kind of stuff. Um, you say, but Dale, you know, so the, the balancing act is, or the adjudication or trying to do probability is, will Dale catch me? Or if, if, I, if I report myself, I'm gonna, something bad's gonna happen to me. But, you know, my, I'm gonna take the risk of not getting caught, but, but then it becomes criminal if you intentionally don't do what you're supposed to do. Um, you know, so, so therein lies the issue. I'm belaboring this point, but you get caught cheating on entering disciplinary data and not entering it, you, it, it will not go well for you. 
um, especially if because of that a kid stays in school or or, or a school shooting occurs and they come to find out that you hid something that they did, uh, which is a case that's going on right now. The kid got in some trouble and, and but the school covered it up and, and then he came back and, and shot some people and killed some people in school. How do you think that's going to go for those people? Um, I mean, that that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Uh, I had a deal at a high school where um, star football player raped a girl on campus. And their, their response was to suspend the girl to try to threaten her in not reporting it. Problem was, is it was reported by a civilian, a guy that was there to work on the school scoreboard. Come to find out, this was the third time that they had covered it up, his misbehavior. I mean, once you cover it up the first time, then you, you can't quit. So I had to fire the principal, all the APs, and even the data manager. Did not go well. Not a good day. But this is what we're talking about, folks. Uh, the principal sued and lost in a big way. Um, cost her a lot of money. Not only did she lose her job, she lost a lot of money on her lawsuit. Um, you can't do these things. You, you can't allow children to be harmed in your building and ignore it to cover it up to try to feather your own nest or, or avoid consequences for you. You've got to report what goes on in your building. You are guided by your code of conduct. Every district is required by state law to have one. I'll show you Charlotte's right quick as we're coasting to the end tonight. Every one of you in your district has a district code of conduct. And what it has is it, it defines for you what your, what your disciplinary system is. Uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg uses a level system um, in terms of the range of consequences that you can give for an action. And so as we go through, they have them attendance. It gives you the minimum and the maximum level of consequence. That's what that response means um, that you can give a kid attendance, um, food and beverages, medication, student dress, personal property, toys, games, misrepresentation about being honesty, cheating, UB, honor code violation. Um, the minimum is a level one response, which is basically one day of in school suspension. Uh, the maximum would be uh, one to five, and that's only for repeat offenses. And so when we get to our case study, as I told you, we'd talk about for next week, please understand when it says a student may receive a failing grade, that's just the academic piece. Most of the time we do restorative justice, we try to let them make up the work for a lesser grade. But the disciplinary part is the most that that child can receive is one day out of school, one day of in-school suspension because it's his, we have no, it's his first offense. But the response the teacher was was to manipulate that 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 grade of that one activity, which should have been less than one point of the final grade, to more than 50% of the final grade in order to fail him, which excludes him as zero tolerance expulsion. It excludes him for an entire year. The fact that they gave him the opportunity for an alternative placement that summer does not mitigate the fact that it was a zero tolerance expulsion. It says that clearly in that handbook I just showed you. So Make sure you read zero tolerance expulsion. Read your district's guide on how much you can give a kid for, for cheating. Understand all of those things they factor in. Who, who assigns grades? All, all that stuff. You need to make sure that you understand that. But your district sets the parameters on how much consequence you can give. The state says this is an incident that must be reported. The district says this is how much punishment you can give. And, and this is what we apply the due process to. So here are all the different rules for that district. In terms of everything you can think of, they've got a minimum and a maximum response. Um, so this is what guides when you get that kid in and you've gone through due process, he's written his statement, you, you've heard from all the witnesses and you say, you've done this. This is what guides you on how much you can give him. You obviously cannot give a kid a year-long expulsion for cheating on an out-of-class stowaway assignment. That's literally taking a shotgun to a fly. Uh, but you've got to know that. I mean, you know, now I, I get it. There's some teachers out there that, you know, they think cheating in their class is the same as Bible burning and flag burning. I get it. 
you know, that nothing less than you taking them out back and, and knocking them in the head will, will satisfy them. But we don't do discipline for teachers. Let me say that again. We don't do discipline to make teachers happy. Uh, we, we do we do due process and we do the appropriate thing for kids. Doctors, I'm gonna let y'all close this out tonight with your final thought on, with a final thought on disciplinary data collection and reporting, uh, how you do it at your school. Dr. Hallman, I believe you've got the floor first. All right. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Griffin, Jordan, and I both use educators handbook in our district um, as the, the disciplinary data collection tool. Um, it's obviously, you know, you purchase that separately. Um, it is very good because it does track data differently and you are able to use that. It's better for writing narratives and um, being able to pull out uh, statistical data for uh, suspensions and ISS, OSS placement, and also teachers and locations. So uh, that tool is the one we use uh, currently. Uh, we've used different kinds over the years, but, uh, but that one works well. I do have one of our assistant principals who um, takes information out of educators handbook that's put in and um, they uh, do several things. One, they send out um, emails to teachers to let uh, them know if a student is suspended for a length of time. Uh, they put uh, parent contact information in there, so that way they understand that they're in the loop for that. Uh, they include that in Educators Handbook, um, and then that is also um, sent out, um, uh, it put into PowerSchool for attendance, so that way it's already set up for the suspension code. Um, she also makes sure that the EC department chair is aware if the student is EC, and it puts them over that 10-day count um, where they have to have a manifestation meeting. Uh, just to make sure that we are following that uh, due process also, just in case the suspension does result in a change of placement or if it was a manifestation of their exceptionality. So it's, it's really kind of a, a series of, of check boxes if all those things have to happen. Um, the one thing we don't do is, um, you know, the pulling in a power school is actually easy. You literally click a button with it and it pulls all the information in to power school that is uh, done on a weekly basis and then power school is set. The only time that ever becomes an issue is if you've got to go back and um, add to something in educator's handbook, you've got to remember you need to go back and make the same adjustment in power school. But that way everything is established, everything is consistent. And whatever your notes are um, separately, you can include those. But um, I've always got a set of you know, uh, investigatory notes, uh, statements, uh, other things that are there along with the statement that goes in educator's handbook so that if I ever do have to go in for an appeal hearing, things like that, there's an entirely different set of um, information there, much more detailed, much more thorough. Um, the disciplinary piece for us, and I'll, I'll say this as our kind of, kind of closing, um, we have definitely uh, stepped back this year to try to reassess what our role is in uh, classroom management, student discipline, um, and can we do things differently? Because we had a year of virtual where there was almost no disciplinary issues. Uh, we handle things very differently. Kids come back to school. Everybody is, like you said, Dr. Lamb, you know, some want to drop the hammer and some want to give kids a chance for, you know, uh, 17 times too many sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, finding a balance between that so we can kind of figure out where that, you know, sweet spot is has been a challenge this year. And I, I feel like we've actually made some big progress. Um, you know, our, our teachers, as well as I'm sure across, you know, all of your schools, um, you know, are happy to have kids back in school, but sometimes the kids, uh, they, they don't know how to behave um, just on a given day because something's going on and maybe it's not really a suspendable offense. Maybe they need to talk to somebody. We do a lot more therapeutic services now this year than we've ever done, um, including yeah. on campus, um, virtual, uh, I, I think we call it telehealth, but you know, where they're working with different things. So we've, we've had to kind of almost recreate our checklist before something occurs as a suspendable offense, just to make sure that we're not, um, you know, I guess going overboard with a reaction or response. Um, just sending them home is not going to fix their problem um, at this point in time. And so we see a lot more of that this year with kids who are in emotional crisis, um, having other comments that are, that are being said and done. And so we've, we've addressed that a little bit differently this year than we probably ever have, um, kind of in a nutshell of where things are on the gamut for us. Excellent. A, a point of clarification. Um, when Dr. Holloman talked about educators handbook, 
the the manual speaks to approved third party vendor software. That's what that is. It will eventually go to PowerSchool when you push a button. You can put it in there and it will go. But the state says that you can do that if it's an approved third party software. I mentioned two previously that are not approved and will not upload. And people intentionally do that in order to hide some of this stuff. Um, that was one of those, uh, those games that I discovered when I became in charge of this in Charlotte. They were using a, 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 a software package. And I'm, uh, again, I mentioned two of them a while ago, but they weren't approved vendors and they would not upload and that they were using them intentionally to not get the data to PowerSchool. And so the, what Dr. Holloman is talking about, I think they also use it in Durham, Dr. Griff, Griffin Jordan, it, it's just simply a way to have a richness of data, qualitative data that goes along with the quantitative. Um, that, that's what they're doing that far now. And, and one more point to remember here, um, when you go in and change in educator's handbook, as Dr. Holloman said, then you've got to go to power school. Please remember that when you go in and make those changes in power school, it generates a report that that is noted. Um, so you can't just go in and, and, you know, get, get buyer's remorse, as I call it. You know, once you, you black eye, the swelling's gone down where you got punched breaking that fight up and you got the blood up out of the hall. And you go home and you think about it and you say, well, maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought. And you want to go in and, and, and decriminalize it, you know, instead of it being a fight. Well, maybe it was just disruptive behavior because it makes your numbers look bad. The state knows that when you do that. And you, you've got to go back and be able to say why you did that. You've got to document why all of a sudden, you know, <clears throat> you got punched in the nose on Friday. But Monday, you you, you know, you, you, your pride ain't hurting as bad and your nose has quit hurting and bleeding a little bit. And you start going in and start changing the severity of it to, to lower the severity of it so your data won't look as bad. The state will know. If you go in, they, 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 there is a change report that comes out of power school. So don't don't think that that's going to be a back door for you. Uh, close us out tonight, Dr. Griffin Jordan. Okay, very quickly. Um, I just want to say about Educator's Handbook. We love it. I'm a data person. Um, it's not just for discipline to the district. It's something that your, your staff can work on as far as um, any type of professional development. You can pull, you can do a report on which teacher had the most um, referrals or which students had the most referrals or which day of the week, which time of the day, is it during lunch? Is it at the end of the day, do most um, infractions occur to make your school better? It has all types of data that we use um, in different ways, not just you know sending it to the district for disciplinary issues. So educator's handbook is your friend. So please get to know it very well. And Absolutely. then um, as far as the due process, um, cross your T's and dot your I's. It is a... a um, a particular process that you have to follow. Um, you, you have to make sure you have all your, your eggs in order um, from the investigation to collecting statements. You need statements from everyone that was there. If it was a fight or some you know, major incident, you've got to contact parents, um, school, the, the code of conduct um, is there for a reason. You've got to look at your level defenses, it tells you just like the Charlotte Mecklenburg, it tells you your minimum and your maximum. You're using your uh, mitigating your, and your aggravating factors and circumstances to determine how um, you would um, discipline that, that offense. You uh, market an educator's handbook. If it's a suspension, you've got to make sure you send home the notice of suspension, um, the incident report, make sure the parents get a copy of the code of conduct. They have to get a copy of the board policy that shows why, what they did and how it was offensive and then um, the disciplinary actions that you've taken. And if, it's a, uh, if you're going for long-term, they've got to get um, a right to an appeal form. Um, you cannot let them go out without getting the, the appeal form because the parents do have a, the right to appeal the decision. So there are a lot of different things in paper, um, the paper trail. Educator's Handbook, again, is great because depending on what um, infraction or what decision you come across, they will print off all those forms for you um, 
I'm assuming all the districts, Durham does it, um, all the, the documentation that I need, once I put the discipline action in, it will um, give me all the documents that I need to give to the parents and then um, go forward with your reportable acts, make sure the district knows and um, you should be good to go. But as you get, as you get comfortable with it, um, it'll be like second nature. You just have to get comfortable with uh, doing those types of discipline referrals. Thank you, Dr. Griffin Jordan. All right, to close this out tonight, our last point is, is due process substantive and procedural. Substantive is what you're supposed to do. That's the NCDPI manual I showed you. That's your code of conduct. That's educator handbook, the software. All that stuff is what you're supposed to do. Um, notification, generating the official suspension letters out of power school, uh, all of that stuff. That's what you're supposed to do. That is your substantive. Your procedure is what you did. And the difference between those two is, <laughs> is where you end up losing your job, that you didn't do what you were supposed to do. My final story for the evening is, is we got a, we had a, a, a program in Charlotte Mecklenburg years ago called New, New Leaders for New Schools. It was a way to kind of jump the line without having to go get the principal certificate and go through a program. And um, you carried a clipboard around and followed the principal for a year. And then they gave you an AP job and, and initial certification to try to get you get you started and I had one of those at, at a big high school in the northern part of the of, of, of town um, and all of a sudden um, back the days before uh, we were on the state servers we were on our own servers and we would download our discipline to uh, the power school servers once a month because they were on our servers and we don't now it, it updates nightly but um, you know, it came back that this school hadn't had any suspensions in, in a whole month. And DPI called me up. <laughs> I had a hotline. Ken Gaddis had a hotline to my office. I was his biggest customer. Um, he said, you know, this school didn't have any data this month. I thought, well, it's got to be a technical problem. I went up there, but this young lady they'd hired, they told her when they hired her, we need for you to get the this. We need, we need to reduce the suspensions. Well, what she heard was just don't put them in and just make up your own suspension form and send it home with kids. Uh, don't tell anybody in the school and they'll just be counted up, you know, here and, and the EC teacher and like Dr. Holman said to count against their 10 days. No, no, nothing. She just made up her own suspension form. She said, I, I reduced them. I said, what they meant was is get the teachers out of the lounge and get them in their classrooms and monitoring the hallways and get them on their duty station. Is what they meant by reduced suspension, not just make them up, not just not report them. We had to revert back, oh, I don't know, $150,000, $60,000. Uh, because remember, how do we, how does the state send you money? Average daily membership. Um, uh, there was over 800 suspension days until we caught her uh, that kids had been out of school that we gotten paid for. Plus the other fines, EC, we exceeded 10 days suspension on several of those. Those cost you 12,000 a pop, by the way, when you pay that fine. Uh, about $160,000 worth uh, because she uh, had not followed the process. And my wife, the wonderful person, curriculum lady she is, teacher, said to me, where'd she go? I said, honey, I don't know where she went. Um, she probably went home, but she couldn't stay here. There, there is no coming back from that, folks. When you cost a district $160,000 and I've got to go to Raleigh in person to apologize and, and explain your behavior, you, you, don't, you won't survive that. So learn it, learn it the right way um, and, and be an honest and ethical person. Thank you. We went a little over tonight, but we had a lot to cover. Um, we're, it's going to be all y'all next week. It's going to be all y'all. And so y'all get to y'all get to juggle the balls next week. I'm looking forward to the case studies next week. Um, we'll see you all then. Everybody have a good week and stay safe. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good night, everybody. Hi, right, guys. Have a great week.